Yeah. I'm not going to go into too much detail because on, on most of the other contract uh, trainings, so y'all can go, go to YouTube channel and look at some of the other contract trainings in the beginning, kind of walk through how to access the forms. Um, but I'm not going to go into detail about that today. For the most part, uh, there's uh, you have the, the Trek website. Well, no, well, for this particular, yeah, the Trek website, you can go and get this particular contract. Uh, that form is up there if you just want to download a PDF, uh, but you can't print it, so it's not printable from the Trek website. I mean, it's not a you can't input onto the uh, onto the form, but you can definitely print them out. Uh, then you have HAR. You can go there, uh, and through your HAR membership through their forms manager. You get access to the forms as well. And that has the Trek forms in addition to like your HAR, your TAR forms that are not Trek forms. Uh, and you also have uh, certain services that you can use through your HAR membership. Uh, like I said, the one that Terry uses is Zip Forms Plus. Um, that's actually the one that I kind of use as well. But you also have Transaction Desk. And then you have Dot Loop. So there's about five different places you can go and get the forms, you know, once you're licensed. Uh, the thing about the Trek website that only has the Trek, that only has the Trek. so it doesn't have all the forms, uh, just as some of them. Mm -hmm. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it from um, I'm going to pull it from HAR. Let's do that. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And if y'all have questions, just jump in. Uh, the whole point of this, the whole point of this training is to, you know, just kind of walk you guys through uh, the contract, the contract aspect of that. Shay, you want me to put it on the screen? Do you care? Is this what I'm saying? Share it on the screen. Okay. <laughs> We got Shay in the building. All right, so if you go to uh, blah, 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 tools, maybe, let's see. The message from secure is correct. <laughs> Let's see, I thought it was tools. What else I was gonna do? I'm gonna do a transaction desk. So again, when you log in to HAR, then you'll be able to transaction desk dot loop and be able to pull the forms. All right, so let's. Uh, we already have our Joe Smith. So this is the guy that we were working on. What's this? So Joe Smith was the guy that we was working on. That was the file we was working on last time. So what we can do is, man, let's just open his folder up. And then his last folder. Um, now, this is a house. So no, let's, let's start anew. Let's start anew. Let's start fresh. I like starting fresh. All right, so create transaction. So we're gonna call this person Sally Lou. Sally Lou. That's what we're gonna call. All right, and this is a condo sale. So we're representing the seller. 
kind of, I mean, we're representing the, um, we're representing the buyer. All right, so we're going to say, what's this? Select source. Yeah, All right, let's go find a, let's go find a property to input. Nobody have any condo? Uh, Terry, I know you're working with a guy that has a condo. Does he have an address he's looking at? Yes. What's that at? What's that? Okay, hold on. I have to go to his text. Because <laughs> he gave, oh, give me me, hold one second. Oh, give me the email lesson. Okay. It'd be better if you can give me the email lesson. But if address, we'll, we'll... Yeah, I can tell it's Sage, Sage Condominium. 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 All right, but you don't have that. You can pick any one of them. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, let me let me give it to you. I, I can get that to you real quick. Give me, give me that lesson. Thirty-five, twenty-five, Sage. Mm -hmm. Uh, one second here. It is. What is it? Hold on, bear with me. Just pop it up. He may have emailed it, but let me pull it up. What's wrong, Tier? I'm trying to pull it up. Hold on a second. I have to, let me go to my MLS. Let's see. Oh, see, you taking too long. I could have been and pulled it up by now. This new 3525 uh says they don't have a, a whole too too many. I don't know. Sage what condominium? Mm-hmm. It's probably around 160 something thousand. Yeah. Yeah, I just picked this one right here. All right, let's see. 3525 Sage. Oh, this is just about the high rise. Let me find some. Need a unit. Pick one under two hundred thousand. It would be the one forty nine seven fifty unit one four zero seven. What's the MLS number? MLS is one two two nine nine eight seven five. One two two nine nine eight seven five. Yeah. See what happens. All right, boom. So it's in there. All right, we got our information, got our listing yeah. number, we got all that. Okay, so we're gonna do so, and that was a, that's what we 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 liked about transaction desk is that it'll populate all this information in there for you. So it's already in there. Makes our job a lot easier when we fill out these forms. All right, so let's go ahead and um, go to forms. And the one we're gonna be looking at today is the condominium contract. So now, quiz, pop quiz. Condominium contract, is that a HAR form, a TREC form, or Texas Realtors form? What kind of form is it? Har? P-A-R? Say har? Uh-uh, uh, I didn't say har. No, I did not say har. I you said, said har. Tar. Oh, tar. So tar form. Daniel, you know what kind of form that is? The contract, condominium contract? Is it a trick form, uh, H-A-R form, or Texas Realtors form? Vanilla, you know? I thought that was a truck form. I think it's trick. It is a trick form. Trick form. form. Trick form. All right. Vanilla, what say you? 
Do you know, Shane? Is the condominium contract a check form, a HAR form? Hey, y'all going through check forms in your class? Then between check forms and HAR forms? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're not there yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, but no, yes, it is a trick form. Now, yeah. what? Yes, what's no question. I can't answer. Oh, no worries. So most I ain't yet. I'm just watching. check forms, remember the check forms deal with contracts. the contracts and the addendums that go with the kind, some of the addendums with the contract. So with it being a contract, all of the contracts are trick forms. So new home contract, former ranch contract, uh, the wonderful family contract, yeah, medium contract. Boxes. All of those are trick forms. It's big trash bags, yeah. white right. bread, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. I can Vanilla, boom, muted. All right, so, all right. So we're creating a start a new transaction, create a new standalone, create a new form. All right, so we're gonna do create new form, start a new transaction. All right, so the name. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Create a new form, add existing transaction. That's what we want to do. Boom, Sally Lou. There she go. Let's go, Sally. There we go. All righty, so there's that old... Condominium contract. Let me make it smaller. That came in so big. All right, so. Now, for the most part, there's a lot of elements to the condominium contract, which are the same. And as we go through it, if I skip over something and y'all want me to go into detail about that element of the contract, then y'all stop me. And y'all ask y'all questions about it. Uh, but when you're submitting an offer on a condominium, uh, you're going to need the contract. Uh, now, if it's uh, you're going to need the contract, you're also going to need the third party financing addendum. You're still going to need that. Um, what you're not going to need is the homeowner's addendum, a uh, property uh, addendum for property subject to mandatory home ownership, homeowners association. You're not going to need that. Because that member last time we did the wonderful family contract, that was one of those standard forms that you were going to need. Well, when you're dealing with condominiums, you don't need that form. And as I go through the contract, you're going to see why we don't need that one. Um, if it's an FHA loan or VA loan, a USDA loan, then we're going to need that third party financing to them. If it's a conventional loan, we're still gonna need that third party financing addendum, but to protect the appraisal value, we're gonna need that other, uh, that other addendum. So we'll look at all of those as well. But first we'll just kind of go through the contract. All right, so at the top, is, which is the same on all the contracts, the number one is parties. So that's your buyer, that's your seller's information. Okay, so here we put Sally Lou. I mean, where well, we put the seller's information and then here we put Sally Lou. Now, some agents, they go to, they go to HCAD or they go to the tax record and they pull the agents in from, I mean, the seller's information. I don't do that. I leave it blank. Uh, let the listing agent fill it in because sometimes that information is not up to date on the tax records. All right. So now notice because we had the email listing for the, how it auto populated the legal description information. Uh, I know with the last video, I showed you guys where you could go. To get the legal description information, you can actually go to the tax record. Uh, you can use Realist within HAR to get that information, or you can go to HCAD. Um, there's a number of places you can go and get the legal description um, because they're all pulling the same data from the county records for the legal description. But the great thing is, with, 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 with transaction desk, it auto populates that information in there. So we're looking at Unit 407. So that's the thing about condominiums. The address for the condominium building is going to be the same for everybody. The only difference is the unit number. So for this particular one, we're purchasing unit 407 in the 3525 Sage Road condominium complex, a project. Uh, and then also notice how on the legal description, when you're, when you're working with condos, you're not going to have a lot. You're not going to have a block. The reason you're not going to have a lot, the reason you're not going to have a block 
is because you're on the land. You have a question, Vanilla? No, I, you I, I, I apologize. I had to answer my dope and I just got to, yeah, so, so I'm, 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 I'm on the foot. I mean, whatever I missed, I, I'm sorry about that. No worries. I no, I'm going to mute you unless you have a question. Okay, I'm finna mute. All right. Okay, so what you'll notice about the legal description for the condominium complex, you're not gonna have a lot, you're not gonna have a block because the owners of the condominium don't own the land under the building. That's, that's held in common. That's why it's right here, common land. Um, what they own is their particular unit within the building. So that's what makes condominiums different from you know, single family dwellings. All right, but that's all that, that's the legal description information. All right, the improvements, accessories, exclusions, all of that is the same, just like the one to four family contract. Uh, now, right here, the declarations, bylaws, and any rules of the association. Now, that is uh, specific to the condominium contract. And what it's asking is, has the buyer received the documents? Uh, has the buyer been advised to read the documents before signing the contract? So we get to check that box or we check the box that the buyer has not received the documents. Now, most of the time, the seller doesn't just have on hand the, the bylaws and rules of the association. From Based on my experiences, the sellers just don't readily have that available to the point to where the buyer can review that stuff before signing the contract. So most of the time, you're going to be making the contract contingent on the buyer receiving those documents at a later date. And that's why you put these days in here, certain amount of days after the effective date. Now, most buyers are, you you're, you are gonna want your buyer before they are 100% committed to purchasing this condo, you are gonna want them to review the specific bylaws and rules of the condominium association, because that's important. You don't want them to get into a situation where they purchase this property and there's some rule in there that adversely affects how they want to use the condominium unit. So you do want to recommend that you get that in front of them as soon as possible. Um, all right, so buyer has received the certificate. Now they're talking about the resale certificate. There's actually a form that for most lenders, if they're getting a loan, the lender is going to require the resale certificate or the HOA certificate uh, as a part of, I believe the title company is going to require it as well. So now you got a, like a 50-50 chance of the condominium having the resale certificate already completed to where all you got to do is call the either you or the listing agent, which is called the HOA and they can email it over to you, already completed. Uh, but then you have some where they just do it per transaction. So you got to wait for them to fill it out. Hopefully, if you if you got a good enough listing agent, they would have done all that already up front when they first listed the property. They would have went and gotten one of the resale certificates completed by the condo association. And I'll show you the resale certificate so you can see the kind of questions that it has. In essence, it's a questionnaire that the condominium association fills out. Um, that's pretty much what it is. And it just talks about different aspects of the property um, and the project. All right, so this is where you notate if the buyer has or has not received it and give a certain amount of days. And then buyers receive sellers affidavit. Um, that's an option as well. All righty. What's the standard time frame to receive that? What how many uh, days should you put in there? I would, so if you represent the buyer, obviously you want as much time as possible, right? If you represent mm -hmm. the then you want as least time as possible. So it depends on who you represent. Uh, but what I, I feel like a safe bet would be seven to 14 days. Okay. Seven to 14 days. And also notice how 
right here it says, so if you put 14 days, seller shall deliver the certificate to buyer within 14 days after the effective date. Notice how it says buyer may cancel the contract before the sixth day after the date. So that means if you put 14 days, they get an additional 20 days. I mean, they get an additional six days, which gives it a total of 20 days mm -hmm. to receive the certificate and cancel as long as they uh, says six days after the buyer receives the certificate, you can you can cancel the contract by hand delivering or mailing written notice of cancellation, a certified United States mail return receipt requested. If buyer cancels the contract pursuant to this paragraph, the contract will terminate and the earnest money will be funded to the buyer. So what that means is is that you it, it gives an additional option period in essence, right? If you put 14 days here and they accept it. So now if they don't submit you the resale certificate within 14 days, you have grounds to terminate and get the earnest money back for your buyer. If they do submit it within 14 days, well, you have an additional six days after. So if they said they submit it to you on day three, well, you have an additional six days after you receive it to terminate the contract according to what the um, condominium certificate says. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Yes. So, you know, but again, you represent the buyer, you want as many days because you want to have that window to be able to walk away from the deal, to, you know, with, so you're, you're looking for those little gaps in the contract to give you that, you know, cause you, they say you expect the worst, but plan for the worst, expect the best, but plan for the worst. So, you know, if this thing goes south, you got this clause in there to kind of protect your uh, client from losing their earnest money. Okay, so here we know we put the cash portion at the top and whatever the loan amount is going to be. And the cash por portion represents, I think we talked about this last time, the cash portion represents what? When you're buying a property. Say I got a $200,000 condominium and I'm putting, and the client's putting 20% down. What is the cash, what is the cash portion here on the contract? How would I write that on the contract? Where does the total amount go? Come on, y'all, don't be shy. Tell me where the total amount go. Let me look at my chat. Oh, Daniel say his mic's not working. Okay. Well, you might have to unmute yourself, Daniel. Because I'd heard you before. Unmute yourself and see if you can talk. Uh, and to answer your question, yeah, a condominium and a co-op, it's the same contract. Oh, Daniel got out of there. All right, who knows? Who knows the answer to the question? What do I, I know at the, the top line is what it, do you hear Mr. Davis? Uh-huh, I can hear you. The top line is what a percentage go at. What then, percent? I know the uh, percentage of, of like, the, if both of them got to add the deal, 10% of, 20% of, it got to add up down. to the, yeah, it got to be added, that's what a top line, whatever it got to be added up to the other figure to other, the amount, how much was the amount? 200,000. So the 200, total is 200,000. 200, so where does that go? It's going to go on the third line, then the middle line. Uh, All right, so it's going to go on the third line. Company. Then the middle line, uh, got to be added uh, 20%. Okay. It's like the down payment. Down payment. So where's the down payment? Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. We can hear you, Dan. Okay. I don't know why it even kicked me off right now. So <laughs> that's great. Wait, we got you back, bud. That's all that matter. So all right, thanks. Vanilla, vanilla says, all right. So vanilla, the total amount goes to the bottom line. Terry, you talking about right. where does the down payment go on the contract? The 
It's going to go on that top line, the first line. It's going to be the down payment. That's, gonna That's gonna be the on cash the portion. That's the cash portion. So if they're putting twenty percent, if they're putting twenty percent down on a two hundred thousand dollar house, how much is the cash portion? It's gonna be twenty percent of two hundred thousand. How much is that? Much I know it should be. But I have to use a calculator. Twenty. <laughs> Hold on one second. Twenty percent. Ten. Up to two hundred thousand. Twenty percent, two hundred thousand. How much is that? Times twenty percent. That's gonna be what the uh, forty thousand. Forty thousand. Yeah, absolutely. Forty thousand dollars. So forty thousand dollars cash is the cash portion. All right. Then what goes in that second line? I'm doing it on my phone. It's kind of small. It's going to be the amount they finance. Uh, I'm right. not even looking at it, but I think it's the amount financing. Yes. The last time it's going to be the total. Yeah. Right. So the amount of the loan. So the first, the first is the cash portion. That's the down payment, forty thousand. The second line, that will be the amount of the loan. So if you take two hundred minus forty thousand, it gives you one sixty. So the amount of financing is one sixty, and the total amount goes on that bottom line, two hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So now, mm -hmm. um, this would be, you know, again, it could, it could be third party financing. Most, most, they don't, you aren't really seeing a lot of loan assumptions. Um, or the seller financing addendum. So, all right. Uh, the leases, this just lets you know if there are any leases. So this is for in, you know in, in investors that are purchasing a property uh, that has tenants in it already. Uh, and then if there are any fixture leases, maybe they're, maybe your, uh, say the, uh, it gives you an idea of fixture leases. Mm -hmm. So solar panels, propane tanks, water softeners, Sometimes people don't own those units. They're, they're being leased by a particular company. Um, so this is where you notate that. All right, so termination option again, this is, a, this is the same on the wonderful family contract. This kind of gives you the address. Uh, I mean, the, the title cover that you're using. Right here, you will say deliver to, and then you'll put the title company. So a good friend of the, of the company, White Star Title. So we would say White Star Title, we we'll go at, on this line as escrow agent at, I'm sorry, yeah, at, and then we we'll put their address. Uh, so they got multiple locations, but we'll put them their, their address. And then we will put the amount of earnest money. So say on a $200,000 property, maybe you put 2,000 down, 2,000 as earnest money. And say if you're doing $200 for option money. So you put both of those here. Both of them are made out to the title company. Both of them are sent to the title company. Uh, and then it just lets you know how the buyer can do it. So buyer, buyer shall deliver earnest money of 2000 to escrow agent within two days after the effective date of this contract. If the last day to deliver earnest money, option money or additional earnest money falls on a Saturday. So it gives you all that information. Um, so the earnest money and termination option go together. So delivery of earnest money and option fee, and then termination option. This right here, the term, this is where you notate how many days your option fee is going to be. And if, if y'all hear me using terms, I know for some, of my, for some of you newer agents, if you hear me using terms and you don't know what it means, let me know. Because like when I say option fee, if you don't know what that means, let me know. I know when I first got in real estate, it took me a while to understand the difference between option and earnest. Um, so don't be shy to ask. All right, the, uh, all right, so as it relates to the title policy, so the title policy is usually, is usually paid by the seller, um, but you know, people are, you know, people are asked, well, Mike, isn't it, isn't it true that the buyer has the right to choose the title company? Um, and the way everything's negotiable, we know that. Uh, yeah, the buyer has the right to choose whatever he wanna choose, but if I was the listing agent on a property, I'll let the buyer choose the title company as long as they pay, they paying for the title policy. I feel like whoever's paying for the title policy gets to choose the title company. That's typically how I did it. So, um, so on here, you, you identify who's going to pay for the title policy. Is it going to be the seller? Then you would click the seller box. Or is it going to be the buyer? And then you click the buyer box. And you got title company information. Um, I'm not going to go through this button, recognize at the bottom of each page, the buyer initials. So on your offer, 
once you're submitting it to the listing agent, all it's going to have is your buyer's initials on the bottom of each page. If you look at the bottom of each page, you see the slot for that. And you're going to have your buyer's signature. The seller's information is not going to be on the contract because you're, you're submitting it. Like you're submitting it for the seller to review. The only time that the seller's information gets added is once they accept the terms of the contract. And now y'all are executed, which is what we want to do. We want to get some stuff on the contract. Okay. Uh, Talk about that. Uh, a lot of the black and white, I'm not going to read because you guys can read that. I highly encourage you. Yeah, I'm making these videos, but if you really want to get well versed in these forms, the only thing you got to do is read them. Like the end, like there's, there's no um, secret to any, to any of this stuff. There's no, there's no, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. I can't think of what word I'm looking for. Uh, my point is, if you want to know, how, if you want to know the forms, read them, keep reading them, read them, read them for understanding. Um, and then that's how you're going to know the forms, right? You know, it's not a matter of amount of times or, or years or webinars or books or any other stuff. It's not, it's not complicated. Read the forms if you want to be, if you want to be well-versed in them. All right. So this one objection is just pretty much says once the, once the buyer receives the title commitment, then they can object within a certain amount of days if there are any exceptions or encumbrances to the title. And right here, you, you can leave this blank because it said buyer, buyer must object the earlier of the closing date or. So you want the closing date. You want to give the buyer as much time as possible. You don't want them to have to make that decision sooner. So we lead this, we can leave this blank. Um, and all this is pretty much saying is, is that you can't close on the house and then come back and say, you got an issue with the title being messed up. And really the title, if there's any encumbrances to the title, then the title company's not gonna close on it no way. So everybody would be notified of what's going on. All right, this talks about title notices. So you can look through that, read all of that. In addition to the signature at the bottom of each page, the address, is going to be at the top of each page as well. The good thing about using these softwares is that it automatically populates it for us. So that's what it did here. All right, property condition. This is where we make notation of if we have or have not received the seller's disclosure. Um, a, good, a good listing agent will have the seller's disclosure already filled out and on the uh, MLS write-up for the property. That's what a good listing agent does. It has all the forms and everything already uploaded. Um, but there are some listing agents that you have to chase them for this stuff. So if that's the case, if the seller's disclosure notice is not already on the MLS listing, you would just click on box two. I usually give them two days, right? Because you should have it already done. And if you ain't got it already done, then you got 48 hours to get it to me after execution. Because here's another one, one of those things that if we never receive the uh, seller's disclosure, if we never receive it, then um, you can terminate. And then they also give you, if seller delivers the notice, buyer may terminate this contract for any reason within seven days after buyer receives the notice or prior to the closing, whichever first occurs and the earnest money will be refunded. So here's another one of those things where, yeah, you can give them two days, but realistically you can give them two weeks. Because whenever they submit you the seller's disclosure, whether it's out, inside of your option period or outside of your option period, according to the contract, you have seven days to terminate if you don't like what's on the um, seller's disclosure. And you get your earnest money back. It says for any reason, right? So you, uh, you could get the seller's disclosure and say, you know what? I, I don't like the fact that it's saying I need to replace these... Uh, Electrical outlets, <laughs> plates, electrical face plates. I don't like that. So I want to terminate. And if it's outside of the earnest option period, it doesn't matter. You get your earnest money back. So that's another one you want to be careful of. So, I mean, I say 48 hours, but really you drag this thing out 14 days, 21 days, whatever. It just, but it's in the seller's best interest to get it to you as soon as possible. All right. Uh, Texas Property Code. Let's see. Now, there's some people that feel like 
because they're investors or because they never lived in the property that they don't have to fill out a sales disclosure. That's not how that works. Um, the only time that a seller, uh, the only time the Texas property code does not require the seller to furnish the seller's disclosure is if, if it's uh, an auction property or if it's a foreclosure. So it's only, a, it's only under a few circumstances. Being an investor or not living in the home or you know, being a landlord has never been um, uh, allowed, uh, you know, that has never been something that qualifies you for not having to submit the seller's disclosure or fill out the seller's disclosure. But you're gonna hear that, like if you're listing a condominium, you're gonna hear some people feel like, or uh, uh, you're trying to buy one, you're gonna hear the listing agent say, well, my client is an investor. They never lived in the property, so they can't fill out the sales disclosure. And you'd be like, well, by law, they still got to figure it out. Even if it's blank, they need to fill out something and they need to sign it. All right, this right here, buyer accepts the property as is. So something that we used to do in the past, that's why they had to put it in there. We would put property as is, subject to inspections. We can't put that there no more. So the only thing, the only time you type stuff on this line is if, for instance, the seller says we're going to change the we're gonna we they say in the MLS write up or upfront that we're going to do that like we're going to fix the floors we're going to change the AC we're going to I don't know change the blinds out so if there's some kind of repair or treatment that they're that they've already verbally agreed to or written agreed to prior to the contract then that's when you write that on that line so you know. I accept the property as is, provided seller fixes the AC. Oh, okay. that's how that works. Uh, residential service contracts; those are home warranties. Um, so you know we have a partnership with Cinch Home Warranty, um, and those are the so that's what so residential service contract is just another name for home warranty. And um, most of the time, the seller will contribute. You know they'll pay for it for the first year. That's something that we negotiate in some instances, depending on how competitive the market is. As a buyer, if you want to risk getting a getting accepted or not, getting your contract accepted over a $500 on warranty, sometimes it's not worth it. Uh, but if you do want the seller to pay for a home warranty for the client, the client wants that, then this is where we will put it. It's the same place in the wonderful family contract. Same verbiage. All right. So brokers and sales agents. So this is where you disclose. Yeah. This is where you disclose if an agent is buying it or if you're purchasing your own. This is where you disclose that you're licensed in the contract. All right. So closing. This is where we put the closing date. So we put that in the contract. Uh, possession, you can either pos the buyer can either possess the property upon closing and funding or according to a leaseback, temporary leaseback. And that was something that we went through um, last time as well. So I'm not going to go through that. But there's, there's another form. It's a TREC form. It even tells you right here. Temporary residential lease form promulgated by TREC. Okay or other written lease required by the parties. So we actually have a form that deals with the residential lease back. So you use that form if that's what's needed. And all that is, is, is that the seller wants to close on the property before moving out. So if they need a couple of, maybe they need, maybe their other property is getting ready or maybe they're about to relocate out of town and they need a, a week or so, or maybe even sometimes a couple of weeks, then they're going to lease the property back but they're going to do it after they close on the property. And, and there's a particular form that we utilize for that. Uh, again, provision, special provisions. Stay away from putting stuff in special provisions. You know, if there's something, if there's a particular situation or scenario that needs to be dealt with, uh, if you first have to ensure that there's not a contract addendum or form that's already been promulgated, for use. Um, so now if there is not a form that addresses your particular situation, 
then we consider writing stuff in special provision. But over the years, this, this space in special provision has gotten shorter and shorter and shorter <laughs> uh, because they're really trying to steer us away from adding, adding anything to the contract because we're not attorneys. Right. All right, so I know with a lot of times you hear about the seller contributing to the buyer's closing costs. Well, this is where it will be inputted. This is where we, we notate in the contract that the seller is gonna contribute a certain amount of money uh, to be applied to the buyer's closing costs. Uh, so that, that number, and the keep in mind, again, depending on how competitive the market is not an absolute, right? You don't want your buyer coming into this feeling like it's an absolute that the seller is gonna contribute to their closing costs. It's not, that's not an absolute. It's a negotiable piece in the contract. So depending on how competitive you want your offer to be will dictate if you ask for the seller to contribute. It's the same as, you know, depending on how competitive you want your offer to be will dictate if you ask for them to do a home warranty for you. So it's not a given. It's not a given that the seller does the home warranty. It's not a given that the seller will, will agree to paying money towards the buyer's closing costs. So it's, be, it's always best for the buyer to know that going in um, so they don't, they don't, they're not shocked if the seller comes back and says, we're not giving you no money, um, you know, or definitely not the, the amount that you're asking for. All right. But if we do get the seller to contribute, agree to, uh, to agree to contribution this is where we will put it in the contract. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that we don't need an HOA, a property for mandatory HOA. The reason we don't need that form is because that HOA information has been embedded into the one into the condominium contract. So here's another here's you know shows one of the spaces where that information they've taken that information from the addendum for mandatory membership in a homeowners association. They've taken that information and they've actually added it already in the contract. So right here, buyers shall pay any and all association fees, deposits, reserves, and other charges resulting from the transfer of the property not to exceed. Again, if, the, if you're representing the buyer, you want to put a smaller amount. If you represent the seller, then you want it to be a larger amount, right? Because this speaks to, you know, if the transfer fees are $300, well, if you put $25 here, that means the buyer pays $25 and then the seller pays the other $275. If you represent the seller, and if the buyer puts 250, that means the buyer pays the 250, and then the seller only has to pay what's left, which would be the 50 dollars. But this is why we don't need the uh, condominium the, that membership, the dinner for mandatory membership in homeowners association is because the the verbiage is already added to the contract. So that's another difference between this contract and the one to four family. Uh, prorations, that's the same in one to four family. Casualty loss is the same. Default is the same. Mediation is the same. Attorney fees is the same. Escrow is the same. So all of this stuff is, is the same with the one to four family. Representations, federal tax requirements, all of that's the same. Uh, again, with notices, you want to go ahead and add, you know, this is really for the title company. Um, so your client's mailing address will go here client's phone number, client's email address, fax number, if they have that. That information will go here. The seller's information will go there. So the title company has the information that they need to be able to reach out to the client. So go ahead and do that. Now, you don't want to be reaching out to other people's clients. Like Even though you have the seller's contact information the seller and the listing agent has the buyer's contact information, you don't want to be reaching out to nobody's client without their permission or unless it's just absolutely like it's got to be your wild card, right? If, if some if a deal's not getting done, if if the if the deal's at risk, and you feel like your listing agent or the cooperating agent is is not adequate, they're not getting the job done, then at the last, <laughs> let that be the last bullet in your uh in your chamber, calling that person's client. To, to try to get the deal to keep moving for the sanctity of the transaction. But for the most part, don't be calling their clients. All right. If you want an agent really mad at you, let them find out you can call their client. 
honey bay. Don't do that. Okay, uh, and then this is where we put the addendums that we're going to use. So again, if they're getting a loan, whether it's FHA, VA, USDA, whatever, if it's a loan, then we're going to use the third-party financing addendum. Now, if it's a lease back, right, we got seller's temporary residential lease. Um, we Now it looks like we have a buyer's temporary residential lease. So that's if a person needs to lease the house before they buy it. This is new. Uh, but that's also an addendum. Um, seller financing, you got that. Uh, let's see. Trying to, oh, here it is. So now this was that addendum that I was talking about that you need if if it's not a FHA if it's not a FHA loan if it's a conventional loan then you need this addendum concerning right to terminate due to lender's appraisal if you're gonna be able to terminate if the condominium doesn't appraise. So for instance, if we have it under contract for 200,000, we do the appraisal and you're using a conventional loan and it appraises at 180, well, if you don't have this addendum, although you've done the third party financing addendum, if you don't have this addendum, then just because it didn't appraise for 200000 you don't have a right to terminate and get your earnest money back. Now, you can still terminate, but you don't get your earnest money back, right? So you got to pony up that extra twenty grand unless you have this addendum filled out and added with your offer. So you want to make sure you submit that as well if it's not an FHA, VA, or a USDA. If it's not a governmental loan, so that's FHA, VA, USDA, those are government back loans. If it's not one of those, then the third party financing addendum does not cover you as it relates to the property appraising or not. You need this additional addendum. All right, so those are addendums. Do not put anything here. If you put something there as for attorney, then that attorney has to get paid. So don't put nothing there. Even if they say they have an attorney, do not add them to the contract unless you are gonna cut them a check. Um, and then both parties sign it. And then this is the broker information. Another great thing about, again, this uh, transaction desk is that they auto populate all this stuff for you. So that's cool. All right. And then here are your receipts. So the last page, oh, also make sure you put your commit. This is where you make sure you get paid. Although it's on the MLS, if it's on the MLS and they market a commission, even if you don't put none right here, then they have to pay it. But Let's, you know, get rid of all the cloud and the smoke. Go ahead and they're paying 3%. That's on the MLS. Make sure you type it on here and that it's attached to the contract showing that you're getting paid your money, you know, just in case. All right, and then these are your receipts. Now, the title company fills these out. So they'll fill out the fact that they received the option money. They'll fill out the fact that they received the earnest money. They fill out the fact that they received the contract. So these first three receipts are going to be filled out by the title company. And then this is only if the client comes back again and, and deposits additional earnest money. Is that one going to be completed? All right. So any questions about the contract before I pull up a couple other forms? Yes, Mr. Davis. Mm -hmm. when, when you were saying about them addendums, don't you always got to add the uh, lead paint addendum on there? Mm -mm. You don't have to add, you only have to add that under certain circumstances. So who can answer that question? When do I have to add the lead-based paint addendum? Um, if the property was built in 1964, 1960 uh, yeah, 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 okay. Let's go, Shay. When, Shay. Shay's gonna answer the question. Let's go, Shay. Okay. Do we have to use the lead-based paint addendum? If the house was built during a certain year. What year? Yes, certain year. 1978. Let's go, Shay. So if the house was built. Yeah, I don't say. Yeah, it was built on or before 1978, then you got to use a lead-based paint addendum. If it was built after, so if it was built 1979, 1979. you don't have to use that one. All right? Okay. All right. Way to go, Shay. All right, what other questions we have before I pull up the other forms that we talked about? None? Okay, so 
we talked about the third party addendum. What, what kind of form is that? Is that a trick form, a Texas Realtors form, or a HAR form? The, the third party financing addendum. Trick form. Trick form. All right, Vanilla say trick. Anybody disagree with Vanilla? All right. Um, Shay says a HAR form. All right. How many people say it's a trick form? All right. Don't be shy. How many people say it's a, a, a trick form? All right, how many people say it's an HAR form? Shay. So I'm assuming everybody else just, yeah. okay. So pick one, either TREK, HAR, or TAR. Which one is it? Huh? Y'all still there? Just pick her. You'll be either right or wrong. And then once you pick, you know, know. you're wrong. I don't know why they. I don't know I'm, why I'm, they. I'm here. I'm here. Listen, I know where to find it. I think it's a, uh, it's an addendum, so it may be a. Oh, I have to look and see. Vanilla says. I know trick. where to find it. Shay say, trick. Hold on. Vanilla say it's trick. Shay say it's um H A R. Who's team Vanilla? Who's that's another one. I think. I think that's a tough one. I don't get off my team. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Let's Terry says it's a tar. Team. So we got Team Terry now, too, because she uh, says I, it's a I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've been saying tar for everything. So yeah. <laughs> I know where to find it. I know where to find it, though, if I ever. Yeah. If I really know. All right. Oh, let's see. I'm back in the chat. Let me see one more chat. Uh, let's see. Daniel said he didn't hear the question. The question is the third party financing addendum is that a TREC form, a TAR form, or an HAR form? Jamie says HAR. So Daniel, we just waiting on you, but which one is it? Everybody's got an answer. Daniel says trick. So Daniel's team vanilla. Jamie is team Shay. And Terry is all by herself. <laughs> that means Terry. <laughs> Terry may be wrong. <laughs> all right. I've so I've just been on tour all day. <laughs> <laughs> nah, so it's a uh, it's a trick form. Now, what did we say the trick forms were? It's a trick. The trick forms deal with contracts. Contracts. All right. Now, what are we talking about right now? Contracts. 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 So any of these addendums that I'm got that I'm about to pull up, what do y'all think these forms gonna be? Right. Not a trick question. It was a trick question. <laughs> Why would you ask if they're all involved? Good. I'm trying to get y'all to understand the concept. Trek created these forms to deal with the purchase agreements and the contracts, like all these other notices and disclosures and all the other stuff. Those are HAR forms. Those are not trick forms. So all of these addendums that I'm going to pull up, they're going to be what kind of forms? Trek. Trek. Trek forms. Trek. All right. All right, so let's see what's in there. All right, so that right to terminate due to lender's appraisal. Remember, I talked about that one. So let's see if I can select all of them at once. So we're going to select that one. Uh, let's see. You know, you got the little backup contract just in case you need to do that. And notice how the addendums are for each for, uh Single family, one to four family, and um, condominiums. You use the same addendum, except for the mandatory membership and property owners association. Like you don't have, to, you don't use that one for condominiums. Uh, and then probably some of the others that deal with lands, so like this one right here, addendum for reservation of oil, gas, and other materials. Like you wouldn't use that one because you don't own the land. Now this is that seller's disclosure. So did, when when do we use this addendum? Sales disclosure of info on lead-based paint and lead-based paint ha hazards. When will we use that one? 
When we use the, if the property was built uh -huh. on or before 1978. There we go. Yeah. There we go. All right. Uh, we talked about that regarding residential leases. So uh, I'm going to show you all that one too. Uh, soon loan. Uh, we'll look at the amendment. All right, here's that resale certificate one. Let me show you this one too. I don't think I went over that one last time. So this is what you want to submit when you're trying to terminate. that one i did go through that one last time too all right so we're gonna we're gonna uh, let's see okay all right okay. yeah. open them all up and right, let me go back to my transaction Sally Lou, baby. All right. How can I add? I'm going to add some forms in there, Sally. <laughs> Let's see. Forms. There we go. This is where I need to be. Add. Track forms. Here we go. All right. Let's see. We're gonna do that one. This one. All right, so we we look at the contract. All right, uh, so this is that condominium resale certificate. So like I said earlier, so what you would do is you would send this to the condominium associate a uh, uh, building or the condominium owners association and then they will mm -hmm. fill this out they will fill this form out so these okay. are, these are some of the questions they ask about declaration common expense assessment you know there is there is not a common expense capital expenditures and so understand you don't need to know what none of this stuff means just know that this is information like they know what they know what it means like when a condominium owners association receives one of these, they're going to know what all what what this thing is asking. So all you need them to do is fill it out, um, and then that's it, and sign it and send it back. Uh, like I said, the lender is going to want to, and then right here it says require. So they have to include their operating budget, insurance summary, and balance sheet. These are things that the lender, if your if your person's getting a loan, that lender is going to want to see this stuff. Um, so. Go ahead and be in the front of it. So, so my question, do we have to submit that to the association or should they all, should the um, listing agent so this is, submit it? So this is how I'm going to answer that question. It's not a matter of who should and who shouldn't. It's a matter of it needs to get done. So however it get done, it need to get done. because So it's best practices, we do it. 
If you if you have a buyer, it's best for you go ahead and do it. Just make sure it get done. Now you can reach out to the listing agent and ask them like, hey, have you submitted the resale certificate to the condominium already? And if they say no, okay. then you could ask, hey, are you going to do it? If they say they'll do it. All right, then, you know, find out what you're going to get it done by. But if they dragging their feet, they're not getting it done, then you get it over there to them. Okay. Somebody get it to them so they can fill it out. And I get it to them sooner than later because who? Because sometimes they take forever to fill this thing out and get it back to you. And it, it'll prolong your deal. they hold your deal up. Put in the fill is that? No, they know that they know the information. Sometimes it's just it's not it's not a priority for them. Yeah, so they don't care. All right, I'll go back. All right, so that's that. Um, if you ever have to terminate. This is the notice to termination. Now, the release of earnest money is not a trick form. It's a TA form or HAR form, the release of earnest money. Uh, but the notice to terminate, the trick form is this. And this is how you notify under what grounds you're terminating. So even if you're terminating as it relates to um, your option period, Right here, that's number one. The unrestricted right of buyer to terminate the contract under paragraph five of the contract, which is option period. Or if you can't obtain approval according to third party financing to them. Uh, it doesn't satisfy property approval as it relates to third party fin financing to them. Um, HOA. Right here. That's why you got to have that addendum in place, because if you're terminating under that, this is where it notifies Alex. Paragraph three of the addendum concerning rights to terminate due to lender's appraisal. Um, so this is the notice to terminate form. That Now notice how the seller doesn't have to sign this, only the buyer. All right. All right, so that's that one. Uh, let's see. Here's that addendum concerning the right to terminate. So again, this goes right along with the third-party financing addendum. This is the one that you use. So buyer waives the right to terminate. If the property is not obtained because the opinion of value does not satisfy the lender's underwriting requirements, and all that's saying is if... It doesn't appraise because the lender is going to require it to appraise for the number you're purchasing it for. Even if you put 20% down, the lender is going to require, they're only going to lend, their percentage is only going to be based off of the property appraising for the, the amount that's on the contract. So if it comes in at 180, even if you have an extra $20,000 to cover that difference, the lender is only going to do 20%, I mean, uh, 80% of 180. So you're going to need more than that. They're not, they're not doing the 80% of 200. They're doing 80% of 180. Whatever that appraisal amount is, that's what they're coming in at as far as the amount that they're going to do. So that's the, uh, that's that one. That's that of them. And let's see, resale. Oh, amendment. So once you get something under contract, you get it executed. This is whenever you're making changes or amendments to the contract, this is that one, This is it's a one page. Doc, so it's not difficult to amend the contract. It's just a one pager. Uh, and the amendment addresses a lot of the things that you may amend. Like you may amend the sales price, you may amend the close date, you may amend the earnest money amount, lender repaired amount. So, and, and any other modifications you may be amending to the contract, you just use this one page form to do it. So it's the amendment. And it's the same one for all of the contracts. So wonderful family, condominium, farm and ranch, all of them. It's the same amendment form. So if a counter offer is in play, that's what you would use? No, because a counter offer is not an executed contract. A counter offer, because remember, when you okay. put your offer, only the buyer has signed the contract. 
That's right. Okay. So the counter offer is in essence the seller denying your offer and coming to so you. So you start all over. So you start no, all because no, that's what I did. You no, don't you don't start, start over. over. You don't start over. You don't start over. Well, I'm saying do a new contract. You don't have to do a, do new, a contract. new contract. You don't have to do a new contract because a, a seller can counter offer you like verbally. They say, hey, look, we're not paying 200. We're paying 180. And you say, you go to your buyer and your buyer say, all right, um, I mean, we're not, we're not accepting 180. We're accepting 200. And you go to your buyer and your buyer say, all right, I'll pay 200. Well, you can tell that listing agent, all right, we'll just make the change on the contract, sign it and send it back. And that's just one scratch through. One scratch through. Ooh. That's from 180 to 200,000. They sign it and send it back. At that point, your buyer, all they have to do is initial. And now you fully executed. So it doesn't have to. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. To a new contract. <laughs> I was going back. Thank huh? you. I was going back doing new contracts each time. Okay, oh, no. thanks. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Like you, that can be handled. Like the negotiation can be handled via wow. text message, phone call, email. Like y'all can come to terms just having a conversation. And then once y'all come to the actual terms based off of the initial offer, the seller can make, the listening agent can make whatever adjustments. Or you can take the one, the original offer that you submitted and make the adjustments by just scratching through them and having a buyer initial and then resend it. Okay. So it doesn't have to be a brand new uh, contract. Okay. And you are going to work with some listing agents that want clean. They want clean contracts. Yeah. So they'll ask I think I had it. one. <laughs> yeah, they want clean. But if you get somebody like that, then I wouldn't submit no more offers. I'm like, well, we're just going to negotiate until we come to terms. And then we come to terms, okay. what everybody's going to agree to, then I'll go back and do a new one and give you your clean we're not going to be negotiating back and forth with this offer on on the actual offer okay. uh we did that Thanks. and then third party financing to get dinner i showed y'all that with the other training so all right man well that's that that pretty much kind of covers the documents as it relates to the condominium contract again i would encourage you to read just read the forms like you want to get um if you want to become versed on the forms, it's just a matter of reading them. Uh, and then that's how you're gonna get more aware, more aware and more versed with these particular forms, contracts and addendums uh, and things like that. And, and as always, if y'all ever have any questions about anything, y'all can get with y'all mentor, y'all can get with me. Um, and so you ain't gotta be out here guessing. All right, anything else from anybody? Hey Mike. Yes, sir. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know if you had answered my question or not because I got bumped off. Mm -hmm. The qu the question about what? The co-op. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so co-op and condominium is the same thing. You use the same contract. Okay. All right. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. What other questions we have? I just know I got to remember those three lines. When it add up, uh, it got to add up to the three lines, got to add up to like if it's $2,000, $200,000, got to add up the three lines. Not the three lines, Vanilla. The, the, two, the two need to add up to the third line. Lines. You, I got to All get right. some lines together. I got to get it. Yeah, there we go. I got to get together. Yeah, sure, again. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, what else we have? No? All right, y'all feel like this was helpful? Yes. Yes. Yes, very helpful. Okay, good, good, good. All right, family. Well, y'all enjoy the rest of y'all day. Let me know if y'all need. Thank you. All right, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.